Any questions? So for homework three, are the tokens the alligator, the equals, the other alligator, the idents of the string literal? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. Because I wasn't sure which one of them are together, but with a space in the middle. Oh, I see. Um, I see. Um, it's just XML. Yeah. So the what I meant it to be like an XML, so you can have other sprites them under each other. The less than um, then you have the, the greater than for a regular tag, you have the closing with no space. Okay. Because an XML you wouldn't be able okay. to have a space here either. Yeah. And then then you have the equal. That's it, right? Uh, yeah. there's one where it's like look, it's uh, this and the that's another slash. So opening and then the slash. Oh. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So all of those are separate. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Just just put double quotes around them in the parsing. Okay. Thank you. That's that's what I had in mind. That's exactly what's in the description of the homework, right? Uh. Yes. It is. Okay. Like this. Okay. Well, I can't. I can't see this. <laughs> Other questions. Okay, so the purpose of today's lecture is to introduce a complete programming language that is, at least in theory, as powerful as any other programming language. Anything that you can compute in Java or C++ or Scala, you can compute in this language. Um, it's called SL1, simply so that it's ungooglable. Um, and so it's kind of the simplest programming language that one could imagine. Then we're going to be writing, uh, or we're going to be looking at an interpreter for this language that, that I wrote for you, that will take a program in this language and it'll tell you what that program prints. Uh, or it doesn't print, right? It'll, it'll evaluate the, the, uh, the one expression that, uh, that's a part of the program. And what's going to be remarkable about this is that it's with all of with the scholar that you now know, you know enough to parse and evaluate a, uh, a program, and really any program that, uh, that computes anything that one might want to compute. So the uh, language is a little bit this similar to the scholar subset that you've been, we've been using. It is, has no mutations. It's a functional language. It has functions. Um, and uh, if there's a number of restrictions, though, there are no lists of strings in here. We will be adding lists as a homework assignment in homework seven. Um, so, I mean, you will be adding it to the to that SL1 uh, parser and interpreter. Um, and one could add strings pretty easily. We're just not doing it. Yeah, maybe we'll want one could do it as another assignment or in an exam situation or something. Um, <coughs> There's no compile time type checking. So we will not do any kind of checking at all. If you later want to add a function and an integer, which of course is impossible, the program will just blow up at some point. So both at compile time and at runtime, we're not really doing any error checking. If we did add the error checking, the program would get several times longer than it is. And I don't think it's super interesting to, uh, uh, to do that. I mean, it clearly is something that we could engineer, but I don't think it would teach us in anything brand new. Also, I wanted to not have to worry about putting in a multitude of types. So I, I figure we don't really need a Boolean type. We'll just do what we did in C, you know, and see if you have zero is false, one is true. But I, I wrote it a little differently than in C. In C, any non-zero value is true. I made it so that any positive value is true, because that happens to work out pretty nicely. Definitions, and in semicolons, um, you see uh, here's a definition of a value. It's a value followed by an identifier, an equal sign, an expression, and a semicolon. Uh, it just seemed to make it easier to read to put the semicolon in. And it's my language. I can do with it what I want. I could have omitted the semicolon or made it optional like in Scala, but we're just putting them in. Um, then we have um, all of the programs have the f uh, are, are blocks. 
And so when you write an SL1 program, you write a block that contains, consists of what? It's a definition of a value or a function. And you keep repeating you know, as many value or function definitions as you like. And then you have a single expression. And that expression then is evaluated. You never need more than one expression because in a functional language there's no sense in saying expression one and then expression two. So that's what the NSL1 program looks like. We'll see in a few examples in a minute. Finally, we have function literals. And again, it's in my language. I could make any syntax that I want for functional literals. The one that I chose is one that's vaguely scholar like where I put braces to the left and to the right. Then I have a comma separated list of identifiers, no types, there's no s compile time types. Then the arrow, and then the block that th that's the part of this function. So it's a block, that means you could again have local definitions in a function. Just like in Scala, you can have local variable and local function definitions. That is all of what SL1 is. Let's just look at a few sample programs so you get a feel for what life is like as an SL1 programmer. There's no input, by the way, that if you want to compute something, you have to write a new program, you have to set all the variables to what you want, and then you evaluate it again. Yes? What's the difference with a semicolon and without semicolon? I'm sorry? What's the difference between the semicolon, with semicolon and without semicolon? What do you mean? Like, or, or, like yeah, and that the third line you don't have to. I have so are you saying, uh, what's the significance of the semicolon? It's just that I put, I decided to put it in there to make it easier to read. That way you don't have to, when you, when you as the reader scan this, you don't have to figure out where is the end of an expression. Look at this one here, where the expression is a little bit longer. I said, I'm forcing you to put a semicolon. You don't put a semicolon, it won't compile. It won't parse. That was an arbitrary decision that I made. I could have made it otherwise. It's my language. Right? I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it. Now, you can design your own language and call it my SL1 or something and not have semicolons, and it'll be just fine. It's just the decisions that one had to make. Does that answer your question? Or I, I was looking at the watch to see if it's all over. Um, does that answer your question? Or? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I just wanted to make it like super clear, like when you have something like this here, where you have this value definition, um, and I thought it really accentuates the fact that you have a, an expression at the end. You have definition, 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 and then an expression. That's how the program looks like. So here I have a program that has two value definitions, followed by this expression, and then when you run that, undoubtedly it'll say 25. Here I have a somewhat more complicated program, I'm defining max to be this function literal. This is the function that takes two inputs bound to the parameters x and y, and then it produces an expression. It's an if expression. Now, what does x minus y do? It computes the difference of x, x and y, and if that difference is positive, that means true, and if it's not positive, it means false. So if it's positive, we choose x, otherwise we choose y, so that means that we choose the larger of x and y. That's after all why I call it max. So I've bound max to this function literal. Now when I invoke max of 3 and 4, the interpreter will say what there was max. It will fish out from the symbol table this thing, and then it will apply that to 3 and 4. How does it do that? It will say x is 3, y is 4, and in that context, it'll then evaluate this expression. And x minus y is now minus 1. That's false, so it'll go to the second branch and return 4. So the answer of this is 4. Here I have a more interesting uh, function literal. This is a function of two variables, f and x. And then it's going to make three function calls, f of f of f of x. That is legal syntax, because a function call, if we look here, is an identifier followed by a bunch of expressions. So let's try that with an example. Here I'm going to call three times. 
I'm going to pass a function literal for the first thing and the two for the second thing. And now three times will be looked up in the symbol table. It is this function literal. F will be bound to the first literal and X will be bound to two. Then it's going to compute. It's going to go from the inside out. First going to compute F of X. How is it going to compute that? It's going to look up what was F. Oh, F was this function literal here. And what was x? Oh, x was 2. Then it's going to call this thing, binding this x in here to 2, and out will come the 4. That 4 will be, can then get put into here. So it'll compute 2 squared, and then 4 squared, that's 16, and 16 squared, or 256. So finally, this is how you make a recursive function. Just like in Scala, you have to use def for a recursive function. You can't do val. Uh, recursively. And so here is the factorial function. x is mapped to, if x means if x is greater or equal 0, or if x is greater than 0, I guess. If x is greater than 0, then you compute x times factorial of x minus 1. And if x is less equal than 0, then the answer is 1. And again, you see how useful this, this trick is to say that positive numbers should be true. So here I have my definition, a semicolon, and then fac of 10 and so when you run this program, it will stash the definition into the symbol table. And then when fac of 10 is evaluated, fac is bound to the definition. The function call will be parsed and evaluated, and that'll give you whatever 10 factorial is. So that's SL1. Uh, you've seen on this slide basically everything that SL1 can offer. But it is a true fact that uh, that's really enough to do any kind of computation. Any function that you could could define can be programmed in SL. So <coughs> we're going to be looking at an interpreter for SL1. So that's a program that reads in a string, a multi-line string that looks like this or like this. Oops or whatever, and it's then going to, first of all, parse it out. So that's what, our, what we always do with the parser. We read in the entire text of the program, and then we turn it into an object. And actually, the object that we will be getting is a block. So this thing will be a block. This thing would be a block, and so on. It's a block because you have a number of definitions followed by a single expression. Here, you know, definition followed by a single expression. So we're going to be parsing this thing into a block. Now, when we evaluate that single expression, we of course need to fish out the values from the symbol table whenever variables are used. And otherwise, we have multiplication and addition and so on that we handle the way we've done it for several weeks now. But there are a few things that we have to put in that, that we haven't seen so far, in particular if else and function calls. So um, when you go here, you can see here we had an if else that previously we did not know how to handle. I'll show you how that's done. And over here you have a thing that's a function and then an opening parenthesis and parameters and a closing parenthesis, so that's a function call. Now notice that we don't particularly have to do anything spe special for a function literal like this. A function literal just evaluates to itself. There's nothing that, that's being done with it. So that's what I just said when you evaluate a block. You add whatever definitions you have into the symbol table, and then you evaluate the single expression with that table. Now, we looked at the symbol tables before, way back when, and in fact, oops, I guess not in this lecture. I had that lecture here, yes. That lecture? No, that's still. Let me try to find that. This was the first lecture where we defined, where we constructed a symbol table 
by, uh, by having a map from very variable names to their values. And we then built it up by adding more and more things to it uh, with this eval function. We had two eval functions. Um, we had the eval function that evaluates an expression given a set of symbols in a map. And then it used the symbols whenever we needed to look up a variable. That's also you needed for homework six. Right, where you have the same situation. You have a block that you need to evaluate. You have variable definitions. You put them in a symbol table. Uh, that's exactly the same thing here. And somewhere we had an eval function that augmented the symbol table, um, or just has to implement it. Um, presumably, you uh, have found that somewhere in uh, on, on uh, Piazza or in one of the videos. You will need, of course, the same fi function for, uh, for homework six. All right, now, we used a map in those things, and you, um, there was some discussion in Piazza whether you should use a map also for homework six. My idea was that you would use a map because you can just reuse the existing code, and there's no reason not to. Um, there's some free spirit in, uh, said, well, can I use a list? And yes, you can. And in fact, we're going to be using a list today for, for a different reason. Um, so in, in homework six, I don't really care which one, which of the two approaches you use. I think the map is simpler for homework six. Um, so we run into two limitations with the approach that we had with a map from strings to integers. Number one, that not all of our values in this language are integers. There's two kinds of values that we have, namely integers and function literals. So if you look back on the SL1 slide, here, you see here we're binding a to an integer. Here we're binding max to a function literal. That's a value. So two kinds of values, integers and function literals. Later in uh, homework seven, we're going to be adding a third type of values to it, namely maps, uh, uh, lists, no maps, lists. So that means that we'd have to have a map that goes from strings to either one or the other. And that's a little awkward. Um, but it is what it is. We're just going to mapping. We're going to be mapping to any. There might be more elegant ways of doing that, but I don't care. Uh, we're just going to say the value is. We don't really know what it is. It could be an int. It could be a function literal. They have nothing in common. We're going to map to any. And what if it's the wrong thing? Then the interpreter will crash. So if you try to add together an int and a function literal then there will be some part of the code that says, I'm going to be forcing both of those to int. And if that doesn't work and it crashes, that's life. We're not doing any error checking at all. If we did that kind of error checking, it would, again, it would just blow up the size of the, uh, of the program several fold without really teaching us anything new. It's obviously possible to do it, right? You could check, is the left really an integer? Is the right really an integer? And if not, you could say, there appears to be an error in line four or something. But then you have to track you know, which line it is in and all of that. That's, that's all no fun. If you want no fun, take a compiler construction course and you get all of those gory details. Um, <coughs> So the other more substantive issue is that unlike the many languages that we've had so far, you don't know whether there is a unique value for a variable. So if I have a variable called A, there may be another variable called A in an inner scope. In homework six, you don't yet have that problem. Um, I don't know if I said so, but I certainly meant it, that you don't have to worry in homework six uh, about multiple uses of the same variable. There will not be val a, val b, val a. But here it can easily happen. Here's a typical situation. I'm saying a is three, fun is this expression here. Inside here, you know, maybe I want to have another variable that's also called a. That's something that you do all the time in your own programming. You don't really worry about uh, what variables are in the outer scope if you, this just shadows it. And we want the same behavior in SL1. It's very messy otherwise to program if you don't have that feature. Now, of course, if we were real software engineers, you know, what we would be doing is we would say, oh, what we really have is we don't just have one map. We have a whole stack of maps. And each time we enter a new scope, we put in another map in there. But 
then um, that would have added 10 lines to this program. So in the interest of keeping it short, I'm just going to, instead of using a stack, I'm just using a list of pairs. And I'll make it so that um, things that come earlier on in the list shadow things that come later on in the list. That way, whenever I enter a new scope, I just cons one or more pairs to the front. And that's, that's all. And that's, that's easy and cheap to do. And then I have a lookup function that you see here that finds something in the, that finds by just going through, uh, through the list up here. So it would cost find. So find does a, uh, does a linear search through this linked list. And as soon as it finds the first one where uh, the, the initial part of the pair matches the name that I want to find. That's what you see here. So this is the, the anonymous thing that I'm looking for. Underscore one is the first coordinate of the thing. And if that thing equals the name, then I'm good. And then I either return, yes, so, so if, if this, this match thing will give me one of two results. Uh, sorry, this, this, this find thing. Find will give me one of two results. It'll either give me a, uh, a solution, a match, wrapped in an optional, in which case I yield the second part of it. Or find will say, I couldn't find any match by giving me op the, the none option. And in that case, I say, OK, I didn't find it. Yeah? So um, how would closures work in SL1? Uh, we will see that on Wednesday. Okay. So that's the symbol table. So our laziness, list of pairs, uh, later definitions come to the front. You know, a more elegant thing would have been to use a stack of maps. And you know, maybe it, we should do that at one point. Sounds like it might be a good homework. Now, how do we evaluate an expression now? So we still want to define eval, as we've done many times now. So eval takes an expression. Um, oh, there was some discussion on Piazza where someone said, why am I making eval so that it's a function that consumes an expression instead of making it as a method of the expression class? Uh, and I could have made it as a method. That, that would probably be you know, as good as anything. Um, it's it makes it mildly easier, I think, to evolve these things right now in, in the various homeworks and exam questions when we have it. When, when you know that whenever you need to evaluate something new, you go into that one function. Then again, you know, maybe the opposite is true. It might have been just as easy for you to know that whenever you have a new feature, you need to define its eval method. So I think it's, it's not much of a difference. I just arbitrarily made that choice at one point and now decided to stick with it. Um, <coughs> So, so eval here is a function that takes both the expression and the symbol table. And then it matches in its normal way. Is it a number? Is it a variable? Is it an operator? Those are the cases that we had previously. And now we have a couple of new things. You know, it could be an if expression. And an if expression got parsed out to have its condition. And it has the block for the positive part and the block for the else part. And then there's a few others that we look at. Yeah, so now the, the slight difference between the eval that you had in homework six and the one that we have now is that the symbols is no longer a map, but it's this list of pairs. All right, so now we want to evaluate a block. So a block has a list of definitions, which could be these vowels or the defs. And then it's followed by a single expression. So first of all, we need to evaluate all the definitions. And then we need to add the pairs to the symbol table. Now I say here, um, add it to the symbol table. It's a little different than in, in homework six. In homework six, you started out with a blank symbol table. And then added the first vowel, the second vowel, the third vowel, and so on until you had the symbol table all com completed, and then you could use that to evaluate the expression. Here, we may not have a blank symbol table because the block maybe is nested inside another block, so we need to come start out with the symbol table that was valid for the outer block. 
So you take the symbol table that previously exists, existed, and then you add a new symbol for each def or val. And so I have a little picture here. So if I take the original symbol, and then I have a def, then I get augmented symbols, and then I uh, keep doing that. Now, so that's what uh, uh, what this eval def thing wants to do. It wants to do to, to take the step from the original symbols and a def to the augmented symbols. So it wants to do like this little triangle here. What it does is it adds a pair that has the name of the definition. And now the right-hand side. There was a discussion in the previous lecture whether you need to evaluate the right-hand side or not. So what I mean is if you have like a val y equals x plus 1, that, and before you had, say, a val x equals 3, what goes into the symbol table? Should, it, should the symbol table say y equals 4, or should it say y equals x plus 1? Should evaluate it. Yeah? Depends on if you want to do it, like, immediate evaluation of the basic value. Right, so, so it, says it depends. And that's, a, of course, I always say good answer. Um, in our language, in SL1, what would we want to do? Um, you, well, in this case, so, so the way that I would like the semantics of SL1 to be is that when I see this x here, and it was just defined before that, that is what I want it to be. So I would really want, uh, want uh, y to be 4. I do not mean when I say, well, y equals x plus 1, that that meaning should be interpreted in whatever context comes later. It's of course possible that someone later will say in a, in a different scope, val x equals the function that turns x into x squared. And now if I later look at what is y, because I'm supposed to evaluate y plus 2 or something, I still think that y should take the original x and not the later x. So given that that's how I, the creator of SL1, would like it to behave. Should now I, the implementer of SL1, should I put into my simple table that y is x plus 1, or should I put into my simple table that x is 4? Y is 4. Yes, sorry, that, yes, that y is 4. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that is what I should do the latter, and I agree with that, because I don't really care how this came to be, I just want to remember that y is 4, and I do not later want to run into a situation where I try to figure out you know, what the x had to be in the original context. So I will want to put into the symbol table not the name and the expression, but the name and the evaluated expression. And so you see, that's what I'm doing here. I'm putting in the name, and then the eval of the expression with the previous symbols. And then I stick that in front of the previous symbols so that now I get the augmented symbols. So I now need to do that augmentation process with each of my definitions. And that's what eval, uh, what eval block does. So eval block computes, that's what this fold here is. It computes the symbol table that I want to use. And that fold here does the following. It says start out with the original symbols. Then you have here on this axis of the fold, you have the first, second, and so on definition. In each step, you do the augmentation. You add the new definition, by get, and then you get a bigger symbol table. That is exactly the eval def function. So that's my fold. The, my seed element, the fold operator, the list of the things that appear on the fringe, and then the function that I use for combining the ith value with the new value. So that's the thing that I do to compute my new symbol table. And that is the symbol table that I give to eval 
to evaluate the expression of the block. So you can see one reason that I can get an interpreter for an actual programming language in less than 150 lines of code is that it, you can express these things very compactly. Right? I have a whole complex computation for taking a symbol table and adding more evaluated symbols into there that fits like into a half a line of code. So to do that in a non-functional language would, would take you uh, quite a bit more. Um, the other thing is um, that I wanted to point out, and I pointed that out on Piazza yesterday, that um, I <coughs> when I uh, designed the exam, which I did last weekend, um, there's an exam question that where you have to do your own fold, and it's not a trivial one. It's not just adding or multiplying or something, but it, it involves a little bit of, of extra work. I realized that the better way of writing the folds is the way I've done it here, where I put in the value that comes in from the left, the value that comes in to the right, and then above that, the resulting value and not the operator. Because the operator is almost always boring. It's, you know, it's op or plus or some such thing, and putting into the diagram doesn't, doesn't add a lot of value. Um, <coughs> and so I actually have that here. That was a question that came up in the previous section that I left here on the whiteboard, where uh, someone asked, how does the symbol table for homework six even get built up? And so I said, you start with an empty map. You consume a definition. That definition says in x equals three. And then out of that, you build the map that maps x to three. Then in the next step, you consume the next definition that was that the same for y equals x plus one. And then out of that, get this value here. And so this way you can see that the values that pop up you know, get, get more and more sophisticated. Um, <coughs> so I, I'll be giving you a, a practice exam where I have a fold question like that and I, where I'm going to ask you to draw that diagram. So have a look at that and then we'll talk about it uh, Wednesday or next Monday. The exam is what, in Wednesday after next. The practice exam is already up, right? Yes. Like on the exam. Yes. Yeah, if you just click on the exam, you can see the practice exam. And so, so yeah, make, make sure to uh, pay some attention to that fold question. It's not a difficult thing to do, but if, you've, if you have to discover this all during the exam, then it's probably too much. All right, moving on. Function calls. So there is a bit of a parsing challenge with function calls. Um, so let me just illustrate that here with some SL1 example. So let's say that I am the parser and I need to figure out this expression here. The fact of x minus 1. So now I'm, let's say I'm right here. I've parsed the multiplication symbol and now I need to make a decision. I only get to see one symbol ahead. We have one, one, symbol, uh, one token look ahead. So I see the next thing is an ident. And now I don't know. Does that mean it's a variable or it's a function call? Because I can't see two steps ahead. I cannot see the parentheses. So the way we do that is like this. We're going to say that the thing that we don't quite get, uh, we don't quite know what it is. We, we, I just call it it's a val or a fun call. And I'll worry about it later what to do with it. So I say it's a val or fun call. And it starts out with something that I don't quite know. Is it... it an integer value or is it a function? So I call it a val or a fun here. And then it may be followed by parentheses. Of course, once it's followed by parentheses, I know it's a function call. But if it's not followed by a function call, then it's just a, a value. And so here is then um, how I parse it out. I say, if I did find the, the opening parentheses, then I return an object that I call fun call. Fun call has the expression to the left, this val or fun thing. And notice it may not be an identifier. This could be a function literal, because it's legal to take a function literal followed by parentheses. What about the args here? That comes on what goes in here. Remember what repsep does. It's a comma-separated sequence of the things here that's expers. So these are comma-separated expressions. They get parsed as a list, and that list of then goes into this fun call thing. So that's the list of arguments, the list of actual arguments. 
If I don't find the parenthesis here, then the opt gives me a none. And in that case, I just return this thing here, which must not have been a function call. It's just a value. Now, it might have been an integer value, or it might have been a function literal. That's the other kind of values not followed by an opening parenthesis. Yeah, so here, that's what I just said, that if you parse this thing here, and then followed by three, that's a valid, uh, that's a valid expression, and we need to be able to parse that correctly. So if we see how what goes further on, uh, on further on with valor fun, valor fun is now defined to be either recursively the parenthesized expression like we've always had, or an identifier which I turn into a variable, or it's a fun literal. And here's how fun literal gets parsed. It's, you have the opening brace, you have the closing brace somewhere. Then you have the sequence of identifiers. These now must be identifiers for the parameters, for the formal parameters. You have the fat arrow, and then you have the, uh, this is actually wrong. Let's see if any eagle eye can tell me what this should be. So you have written expert. So you have it. You have uh, opening brace, comma separate parameters, fat arrow, and then here it's an expert. And I said it's wrong. What should it be? Um, you could have some valdex to it. Very good. I could have definitions in here, right? So what do you call the thing? Wait, it can't have definitions. Uh, a block. Excellent. Yes. So this this needs to be a block, and I'm sure in my program it is a block. I just need to fix the slides. Yeah? So, when we add new scopes, uh, we have more local variables in there, right? Yep. And when scope ends, those are gone from the symbol table. That's correct. So how do you handle it? Do you have that stack of symbol tables? Ah, OK. So that's a very good question. So, so what he says is that we're getting um, these, these symbol tables, and they're getting more and more symbols to them added on. How do they ever go away? And so the answer to that is that when we are in the step where we add them on, which is here, we're adding them on to the incoming symbol table. That's this one here. And so this is the adding on process here. But the adding on process never mutates the, the incoming symbol table. We're building a new, more detailed symbol table with the local symbols. And then after this eval function here is done, it returns, and that local variable is forgotten. The other symbol table has never been changed. So that's how, sc how scopes are managed, by saying that each scope gives rise to a separate call to eval block. So you have these nested calls to eval block. We have like an empty symbol table that comes in from the outset. The next nested call has a few symbols in it. The next uh, has more symbols in it. But then as they get popped off, those more detailed symbol tables just go away. Yeah, that's a very good observation. OK, where was I? OK, so here. So I said it has to be block. And that's, that's what raised your question. Yeah. So moving on, now we need to figure out how to make function calls. And that's, a, that's of course, really important in a functional language. So how do you make a function call? So what is the input of a, uh, of a function call? So when you make a call to a function, if the function was bound to a variable like f of, then we will look up in the symbol table the actual function literal. It has to ultimately resolve to a function literal, otherwise we can't call the function. So we have a function literal like you see here. And then when you call it, then you have a list of actual parameters. So let's say that we're calling this function here, computes the average of these two numbers, and we're calling it with 10 and a plus 2. That's a function call, right? A function plus the, the, the arguments. Here's how you do it. You now need to add two bindings to the symbol table, namely x is 10 and y is a plus 2. OK, not quite. We want, to, we want to evaluate the 10 and the a plus 2 because the symbol table contains bindings from names to values. 
So we need to evaluate, and this eval here, I, I was sloppy, I didn't put in that you need to evaluate with some incoming symbols. But we'll see that in the code. So once we have that evaluated, we now have a symbol table that contains an x is 10 and y is 8 plus 2, and whatever a was um, 3 or something. So, so x is 10 and y is 5. And in that context, now we can evaluate this block in the same way that we've always evaluated a block. So let's have a quick look at how the code for that looks like. So here is our, uh, our function columns. So this is all in the context of the general eval. Eval takes an expression and a symbol table. And then there's a bunch of cases. There's uh, the cases for operators and variables and so on. We're now homing in on the case of the function call. So a function call is an object that has two parameters, the function object and the arguments of the function in the call. So this thing here that embraces the function object and the arguments are the lists of these expressions. And so <coughs> actually, um, there's one more level that I forgot. The, the thing here, the, the front, the fun, this might be a variable, in which case I might have to look up what it is, or it could already be a function, uh, function literal. Or it could, for all I know, be some other expression that is a higher order function that returns a function, whatever the case may be. I do need to evaluate. So I evaluate the left-hand side, the thing that sits before the parentheses. If it is a variable, I look up the function. If it's function literal, it evaluates to itself. If it is itself a function call, then I invoke that function. And so it has to then produce, ultimately, a function literal. If not, there is a type error in the program, and we're allowed to blow up. And so we now say, OK, so what I must have gotten in the end is something where this thing here is a function. A function object that describes a function literal has a list of parameters. That's just a list of identifiers, of strings, followed by the body of the function. So now evaluate the body. That's what eval block does. With a symbol table that you see here. This is the symbol table in which I evaluate the body. So let's see what that symbol table is. It's the parameters, that is the identifiers that describe the formal parameters, the x and y here, as a list. Zipped with this thing over here. So let's see what this thing is. So we're taking the arguments and we're mapping with eval. So what are we doing here? How would you describe in plain English what this code does? Exactly, that's all it does, right? It, it, it takes all the arguments and then evaluates them all and sticks them back into a list. So I started out with a list that had here 10 and 8 plus 2 as expressions. And now I get a list of values, namely 10 and 5. Okay, that's what this part here does. Now the zipping does the following. It maps x to the first value, which is 10, and y to the second value, which is 5. It just makes these two pairs. That's what zip does. It takes two lists, and it matches them up in pairs. So now I have a list of these two pairs, and I stick it in front of the symbols that were handed to me, and that's my new symbol table. Yes? Uh, what is a triple colon? Yeah. A triple colon means to append. OK. Because this is a list, and this is a list, and I need to okay. stick them together. Um, is param is a list of uh, strings? <laughs> Yes, it's a list, uh, params is a list of strings. Uh, I thought no. it was double plus sign for appending two lists. Oh, then, then you can use both plus equal and, and triple colon. I don't know why I switched from one to the other. OK. Um, you know, in, in hindsight, there's 
No, I agree, John. No. Uh, I was going to say that one of them is right associative, but I don't think that matters. <laughs> okay. okay. Maybe it does. I, 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 no. So, so anyway, so it's the same as plus equals. I, I should unify the slides and just make it one. All right, so, um, so that's uh, how the evaluation is done. And again, notice the awesome compactness that once you have a few of these higher order functions, uh, you can express you know, a somewhat complex set of processing in like a half a line of code. Right here we're saying, take all the arguments and evaluate them associate each parameter with it's the argument in the same position. Add that to the existing symbol table and use that new symbol table to evaluate that block. Now that's a lot of stuff that goes on in this one line. And so that's the reason why we can do all of this in a 150 lines, less than that, actually it's like 130 lines of code or so. Um, the one thing that I've omitted today is how recursive functions work. There's a twist to recursive functions that we see on Wednesday. So that's, in a nutshell, what this uh, what SL1 does. So let me just briefly show it to you. So, oh, it's debugging it. So let's just pan over it. <coughs> And first of all, is it really 150 lines? It is actually 131 lines. Okay, and if, I guess I could get it down to 120 if I took out a few of these blank lines. Um, so we have a couple of imports. Um, we have two kinds of definitions, the ones that start with a val and the ones that start with a def. The def ones are the ones that are needed for recursive functions that we'll see on Wednesday. We have a superclass expression like you've always seen we have a block. A block has a list of definitions, which could be either these vowels or these defs, followed by an expression. We now have a bunch of different expressions, a number, a variable, an operator. You know these by heart by now. We have here the function literal. So a function literal is a list of strings, that's the parameters, followed by a block. We have an if expression that has the conditional part and the then and the else part. And it's an expression. And then finally we have a function call where we have a fun and args. Fun is an expression which eventually needs to res result in a function literal when evaluated. And args is a list of expressions. And that again has a value, it's an expression. Then we have a closure thing that we're not looking at today. That, that's Wednesday for recursive functions. Um, so the parser itself is fairly straightforward. Here we have a block that is a repetition of these two kinds of definitions, vowels or, or defs, followed by the single expression. And then it's parsed out into a block by just taking the list and the expression and putting it into a block. We then have the expression. Now, I had to sandwich the if expression above plus and minus because I, want to bind, I wanted to bind more weakly than plus and minus. And as we discussed at some point, that then you just take your normal expression, term, factor, hierarchy, and you s squeeze it somewhere where it makes sense. So I've done that here. Then I've renamed this thing to x per 2, the, what previously was an expression. And there it is. And so the parsing is completely straightforward, except I had to worry about the way that I had to put parentheses around these, these wiggly arrows like, like we are discussed previously. So here we have um, sums and differences, products and quotients, and then I go back to factors. Factors I have whole number, like I always did. Then I had uh, parenthesized expressions to have uh, parentheses, and then I have this value or fun call thing, where I say it's either a value or a function, um, and then it's followed by an optional parenthesis for a fun function call. And so if I have parentheses, I give a fun call, otherwise it gives whatever comes out of the next level. So at the final level, I have, oops, um, you know what? Um, I have a parenthesized list of expressions here, and I have a parenthesized list of expressions here that one of them is, is surely unnecessary, so I should fix that. Yeah? There is, I brought the code into, 
give us an error on line 128? Um, yeah, let's look at, um, someone said this, I think I must have at one point put the wrong code on the web. Um, what do you have? Is that the bell lock? I got that on homework 6 too, but when I tried with SBG, it yeah. worked fine. Oh, I see. So that might be. Just intelligent. Yes, um, someone had that in, in the first. Yes. So, and so what that person did is they put result colon block or as instance of block or some such thing, and then it worked. Oh, let's try that. It's about. Uh, so IntelliJ pre parses Scala just like Eclipse uh, pre parses Java, and every once in a while that, that parser has an error. So the reason you don't get this one in Eclipse is because uh, well, I'll come later on. There's there's a fix for it. Okay. I mean, a fix other than going to to uh, Eclipse. Um, so Eclipse doesn't try to do any intelligence a at all. It, it it simply calls the Scala compiler and it faithfully pr reproduces its error messages. But IntelliJ does try to do its own thing there, and it's not perfect. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's faster, but sometimes it's wrong. It's not All right, so back to where, where was I? Um, term fact. Oh, yeah, I was uh, at this fact that I need to clean this thing up. Um, here we have the parsing of function minerals, values, uh, val, and defs. Uh, that, that's all kind of straightforward. Then here we have that lookup function that I talked about that takes a name and a symbol table, and it looks up the value for that if present. And then I have this very large eval function that shows how to evaluate the various parts of our language. A number of values, so the number of var variables looked up at the symbol table, an operator evaluates the left and the right parts, and then it feeds it to the combining function. Um, we must have had that before. The if expression does I don't think I want to go through it. It doesn't, doesn't do anything interesting. It just evaluates the condition and either the, the left or the right part. The function call, we talked about that. Um, there's two cases, whether you have what's called a closure that we will see on Wednesday, um, or a regular function, the one that uh, we've seen so far. And we talked about that, kind of. Um, uh, the code on the slide is a little bit more direct. So I don't want to get into the uh, differences. Here we compute what it means to evaluate definitions, and uh, we're going to get into that on Wednesday. Here we have eval block that we've seen on the slides. And then finally, we have the familiar lines, what we call the parser, we call parser, and then we evaluate the block and print out the results. So that's it, what an interpreter for a complete programming language looks like. So in the lab, there's a few things that I'd like you to do is uh, first write an SL1 program. It's a very simple two-line program. Uh, we have a recursive function. So that gives you a bit of a feel for it, what SL1 is like. Th then I want you to understand the parse tree of some SL1 expressions. And so what I think you should just do is modify this program here, comment out the eval block because you need it later again, and just print out the result itself. That way you'll see the parse tree. And so it suggests here, yeah, and if you have plenty of time to do that, is to write the parse tree sidewise with some dashes to the in, to see the indentations. Yes? So I just ran the program as it is, and I just I wrote in my own very similar to the first example on there. And you could just copy and paste the program. Yes. The internet has control D. Yes, oh yeah, actually that's, yeah. Let me let me do that real quick to, to show, because some people have trouble with that. Um, let me... So, yes, so it, it, I don't know what it was, break one. So now I get this display, there's no prompt or anything, um, because, you know, I wanted to squeeze it into 150 lines of code. Um, and so now I can just copy something. Is yours running through SBT? No. Oh, okay. You can do that too. It really gives you a lot. It spits out a lot. Well, that's SBT, right? It's, SBT can't shut up, yeah. Um, so let me. Do you can with an SBT? You can, absolutely. So I, I'll do it both ways in a second. So here I'm just going to copy this thing here, paste it in here. Now at this point you have to know the magic keystroke to tell the terminal that you're done, which for both Eclipse and for IntelliJ apparently is Control D. And Mac users beware, it's Control D and not Coke Bottle D. 
And then when I hit Ctrl D, supposedly it should finish. It, I had about a 50% hit rate with that the last time. So let me try this one more time. <laughs> it means that sometimes it just hung. So I, uh, I don't know why. Now it works. With, with read-in, this is an important note, um, with, this, with the input screen reader, is that if you try to read in again after you've done that, it will throw an exception. And there's more than one way around this. Yeah. Um, you can use, I think it's like a, <coughs> I figured out another way to do it where you yeah. can just read in individual lines. But if that's not what you want, then... Yeah. No, I mean, at this point, I don't know how many lines, right? And I didn't want to, like, I... It, okay, anyway, it is what it is. And uh, maybe if one, like, put a dot at the end or something and only use parse, I don't know. It, it's... Uh, th we'll get through it. It's, this is obviously not a, not a professional development environment here, right? So if you want to do an SPT, that's, that's cool too. So you would go to the root directory. Uh, so I've saved this in SL1, and then you would say SPT run. And then you see all of these outputs that you were alluding to that are kind of annoying. Um, now it's compiling everything. And now it's finally running. Now you, you paste in your thing. Um, and again, you have to hit Control D and you get your answer. So do whichever way you prefer. Is there a possible way that we can do it, like we write and we just run it? Say again? Can we just write in a like a main class? You can, but then you have to do a lot of editing and these things get longer. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to, you could rip out this thing here and put in um, like a multi-line string. I'll just show you how to do it um, and then I'll undo it again. Um, so you could put a multi-line string like that and then paste it like this. And that would also work, um, but then you have to 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 modify the program every time. That doesn't seem seem any better. So the reason that I'm suggesting that you practice it this way is that way when you really want to test it later for your homework. Here's what I do for the homework. So I guess I should I, I should prefix that. So now I can put make some file. I call it myprog.sl1. And now I can run um, SPT run and redirect from my prog. That's, this is what you're going to be doing in the next homework. And then you can do it as often as you like. Right. Oh, uh, where, is the text file, where is the text file supposed to be in the directory? Well, it is then in the, in the root directory. There's the thing that contains you know, source and so on. Okay. Because when that's where you, where you run SPT run from. Yes, sir. So something I noticed. Yes, yes, and in, in, that is exactly right. And in fact, if you look at the description of homework, even in homework six, right? Didn't I say that? No, because you couldn't. Oh, wait, I lied. You have it Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had to look that up myself. Okay. Yeah. And it's weird because older versions of SPT have run Yes, yes, that is a true pain of SPT that it does change. So be, be sure to get the latest version of SPT. Um, yes, so that uh, obviously that too is annoying. For some reason, when I try to use the SPT in IntelliJ, it just like pauses when I run that command. Don't use the SPT in IntelliJ. And then yeah, I had to use the one. Yes, yes. With all of these things, I mean, make sure that you install the tool from a known thing, because for all you know, IntelliJ uses 0.11.6 or something. Mm. Yes. So with, with I mean, the general rule with command line tools is that trust is good, control is better, 
And so, yeah. If you install it, you know what you install, which version you install, and everything. So I definitely rec highly recommend that. So like also like fishing out some library out of the IntelliJ cache, uh, you know, I'd rather install it myself. And, and so the one thing with SBT, I know what it does when it installs libraries. I mean, it uses the Maven repo and the version number that I put into build.sbt. I know exactly what library I get. So that's, that really is something you want for reproducibility because it really doesn't matter what goes in on your machine. The only thing that matters is what goes on in the grader's machine, right? Oh, that as a, as a quick segue, um, so the grader complained that a very large number of people um, did, uh, didn't uh, structure their homework five solution right. And so he said, well, you told me not to do anything. Uh, they'll just res resubmit. So uh, I brought that up in the first section. There was uniform agreement in the first section that the grader is a knucklehead and he must have made a bunch of mistakes. And I looked at the first one who expressed that opinion vociferously and the grader was right. So before, before everyone says the grader made a mistake, could you please try it yourself? Uh, yes. So I actually did that beforehand. I tried it myself as soon as the solution yeah. was posted and it worked. Yeah. The grader included a line in his um, solution for part three, import homework three object part oh, three, part yes. three, whatever. Um, and that wasn't included in your solution because you didn't specify to put it inside of a homework. Oh, I see. Yeah, so, so if the grader did mess up. Okay. Well, actually, what happened is that there was some people, there was one person uh, where it wouldn't have compiled otherwise, and then somehow I, I put it in, and so if that is the problem, um, then just change your thing that it works with that, because all you have to do is put it in a, in a separate object or right. file, and then just resubmit it. Right. I mean, that was sloppiness on my part to not have specified exactly. What was the one that was added? Oh, I don't remember, but just look at it. So here's what you do. Is it out of 16 points? So, um, so you just uh, unzip my solution somewhere into temp. So I have it here. Uh, so I'll, I'll erase it again. This was homework five, right? So. Uh, yes. So, so you unzip the, the homework five. Then you copy your solution where, from wherever it was into source ma main Scala, and then you run it. So, so I'll just I'll copy Tyler's. Um, Mine's not going to work. Well, but uh, I think you can withstand that. I didn't like the I happy Yeah, because I didn't. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Like I didn't have it in, in an object. So started Scala, source main Scala. Oh, where's my oh, homework file? And then we do SPT test. And now it's not going to work, he says. And, you know, and then fix it up, double check it again, and send me the SPT report that it did work, and then I'll recreate it. Or I'll send it to him if it's too many. The suspense mounts, yes, and so now it says that for but some reason. Before you added that, that's fine, and it's it's entirely uh, in that case. Just put in a object HW five part three around your yeah. thing or some such thing, right? Um, so if it's a trivial fix, you know, make the trivial fix. So is it looking for that part three, but it would be more pulled off? Well, I'm sure the instructions were entirely ambiguous because I figured that I wanted the same structure on all of the three solutions and some people did it like that and others didn't. You know what, that's really weird because I left that in my code and I didn't think it would be, I wasn't sure it was necessary, so I was like, I'll just leave that there, whatever. I didn't really think about it too hard. And I, yeah, I didn't run into any problems with that's the thing, but you would have run into problems otherwise. So, right, exactly. so I should have specified it clearly. No, I totally. Agree. Yeah. So it is what it is. Um, yeah, I admit it because on the other ones you specifically said put it in, <laughs> and then the third one you didn't. So I was yeah. like, oh, okay, I have to do this one. Yeah. So in the future, when you see an ambiguity like that, of which I'm sure there are many, 
then you know, just put a question on Piazza. And it wouldn't be the first time when I, when I said on Piazza, well, this is what I actually meant. Actually, there's not, not much skills based. I'll just, we'll just do it together. Did, uh, did Stefan, or did Stefan make a string that you feed the thing that'll give you the result? I'm sorry? For part one, for the power two, did you just make a string that you feed to the... Yeah, well, let, let's just do it together. I'll show, I mean, it's, it's easy enough to, to just demo it. So I'm going to run this thing. And now uh, I, you know, I can do SL1 in real time. So it's PAL2, right? So it takes a lambda, one, one, one of these expressions, and we'll fill it in a minute. And then we'll compute PAL2 of what? Uh, 2? Uh, 2 comma 10, right? Right, PAL2 of 10. That's how it goes. OK. So x gets mapped into what? Oh, I can't edit here in real time. Um, OK, let me. You know what? I'm going to do this in a terminal, and then I'm going to feed it in. So it's def how 2 equals x gets mapped into if something else something then a semicolon and then power 2 of 10 okay so there's two cases um, in the, in the normal case I compute x times power 2 of x minus 1 and otherwise it's 1 right 2 to the 0 is 1 so as it happens I can just put in an x in here and that will work if x is greater than 0 then I get the first case and otherwise I get 1 Okay, so now we're going to run this program here again. SP, uh, oh, I see. Now I need to go back to where I was. Which was here. No. It's wrong with terminals. Too, too many. <laughs> okay. I must have lost it. Um, SBT run less than. Let's see the program again while it's doing this. Okay, and here's the solution. Um, that doesn't look too promising. Oh, maybe it, because I should not compute factorial, I should compute powers of 2. I'm multiplying with 2 and not with x. Uh, I think that <laughs> might be helpful. You said the saying if x means if x is greater than 0? Yes. Okay. Yes. And now I get 1,024, okay. which seems much better. OK, so there it is, our very first uh, SL1 program written with our bare hands. Um, that's how that goes. Now. The next thing that is asked for is to observe some of the parses. And so the way to do that here is I'm going to comment out the eval block part here and just print the result, because that will give me the parse tree. And now let's see. And now I'm going to run it by feeding in one of the inputs that the parse has asked for. How is it? So it said, now how does this thing get parsed? And I hit Control D. And here's the parse. So it is a block. Um, that is because every SL1 program is a block. It, is, it has a list because there are no defs and uh, vowels. And then we have the single expression. That single expression, that's the point of this exercise, is a function object. It's a function literal. It has a list of x, comma, y. Those are the two formal parameters, followed by the body of the function. The body of the function is a block. It has no local variable definitions. And it then has an operator, which undoubtedly is here the plus operator, followed by these two variables. Okay, 
So you can try that at, at home with the other two and see what's insi inside those. Um, and you'll need a little bit of that knowledge for the next homework where you need to just know what is a function, what is a block, and so on, because you're going to be messing with them in, in some way for the exam as well. Um, so the third part was to, <coughs> uh, to be able to see what goes on in this running program. And so one of the things that we wanted to know is um, what is the symbol table at various spots? And so the suggestion was to use this nifty little spy function and put it somewhere. What the spy function does is it prints a value and then it returns it. And that way you can just put it in some spot of interest, run this rather complex program, and see what it does. So I'm just going to put a spy around the eval, this eval here, um, where it's being called. And that would be here by eval block, okay. So this is the, the thing. So that's where the spy goes around. Now I have to undo this change because I do again want to evaluate the actual block. Now we're going to run this and it wants me to run this with this program here. And now we can see this is the result from the spying. It is a list of these name value pairs, followed by the final output of the program, the six. So what was the point of this here? So we, we assign a three to A. We say B is A plus one. So that should now be four, I guess. And now we make a different A that we, that we put a two in. And so you can see here in the symbol table, we have the A with the two in front, so it shadows the other one, and then the B with the four and the A with the three. And then when we evaluate A plus B, it really uses the two, because the two plus four is six. So that's how you can spy on what goes on. And it's also a useful debugging thing. You can use the debugger in this as well. Um, so let me try that. So I set a breakpoint here. Let's see what happens if we debug this thing. Now I, I paste in the same thing. Hit Control D. Now the debugger wakes up. And let's see, we are at eval block. We are right here. And now I can like mouse over the symbols and see what's inside here. Well, actually, that's never worked for me that well. But if I go here to the display on the right, then I see that right now the symbols is empty. And now I can actually, with some patience, trace inside here. Um, it's not the easiest thing necessarily to do, um, but I have been able to at, at times do this. It's, of course, you do get a lot of, because this program is so compact, there's so many different pieces that sometimes the tracing is a little hard. When, when you have that situation, it, it's sometimes actually a good idea to put like a dummy statement somewhere and then put the breakpoint on the dummy statement, then you can go there. Or you could like go to somewhere where we want to see something interesting, like this eval here, and I could try to see if I do control R. But that doesn't necessarily work because now it says it's not a valid location to run to. So I found the debugger at times a little frustrating. Um, and so the spying technique you know, is, an al is an alternative to it. Try both, one of the two will work. All right.